I've long held that compassion and choice are two issues that are a part of just about every men's issue. But why? What's the connection between compassion and choice and male victims of domestic violence or male suicides or circumcision or anything like that? Let's take a minute to look at why compassion and choice are limited for men and also how compassion and choice are connected to almost every men's issue. There's a link to a more detailed blog post on this topic in the upper right corner. So what's the reason that men and boys lack compassion and choice? Well, you don't have to look farther than gynocentrism. If you don't know what gynocentrism is, it's basically the idea that uh, women and children need to be protected and provided for at the expense of men. Now, this is something that's been going on for a long, long time. And in fact, Warren Farrell teaches us that every culture that's been successful in Western civilization has, has done this, has created the males to be disposable in order to protect and provide for the women and the children. So this is not something that is uh, men are oppressed or anything like that. This is kind of the natural flow of things uh, where women have been focused on making the, the babies and men have been focused on protecting and providing. All makes sense. But let's let me tell you a story. We can get into why this kind of gynocentrism thing does stop up the compassion and choice for men. So let me tell you a story about a snake. A friend in college had this huge snake. He was a boa constrictor. He loved his snake. You know, when we'd go to his room in the dorm, he'd have this, of course, the people didn't know he had it there. He had this huge snake, and, and we'd all, you know, take care of the snake, and it would wrap around us. And, and But it, when it came to feeding time, he would get these little teeny mice. He called them pinkies. These little, little guys, little mice. And the snake would eat them right up, you know? Now think about it. The guy loved the snake. He was his pet. He was his friend. And he wanted to have compassion and choice for the snake, right? He wanted the snake to have as much choice as he could have. And he wanted, he had compassion for that snake because he loved the snake. But now, how about those little mice? You know, did he give the mice the same compassion and choice as he gave the snake? No, of course not. Why not? Because they were there literally to provide for the snake. They were there to provide. That was their one main purpose. Now imagine if one of those little mice had stood up and said, hey, no snake for me. No, thank you. I don't want any more of that snake. No, 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 no. What would he have done? He said, oh, you're first. Boom, he <laughs> threw it to the snake, right? The same thing happens today with men's issues. When men complain about not wanting to, to take on this onerous role, they get crap. They get fed to the snake. And this is the source of why men get less compassion. Because the guy didn't give compassion and choice to the mice, but he gave compassion and choice to the snake. And the same thing plays out between men and women, but on a much less lesser scale. It's not quite the same intensity as it is with the snake and the mice, but you get the idea. And the idea is we get attached to things that we're close to. We get attached to things that we feel compassion for. We get attached to our grand great-grandmother's silver, but we don't get so attached to the plastic ware we use at a picnic. Do you see what I'm saying? Men generally get less compassion and choice because they are disposable. That's kind of the bottom line. So this whole gynocentric thing has, has created a situation where men have become more disposable and therefore get less compassion and choice. Gynocentrism is a real important piece in all of this stuff, and it's been going on for a long, long time. And if you look at the dynamics of what gynocentrism was prior to 1960, what you see is that um, both men and women were appreciated for the roles that they played. Women were held up as being wonderful as moms, as, as you know, as American as mom and apple pie. I mean, women were held in high esteem and men were also held in high esteem for their sacrifice in providing and protecting. So men got admired and respected for their role. It was a fair trade in some ways. In some ways not, but close enough. But then enter 1960s and what I call gynocentrism 2.0. And that's where things really shifted in a very negative way. Because suddenly, the feminists started blaming men 
for women's problems and claiming that women were, had been oppressed. Now, this is a bizarre claim, considering that they had been taken care of for a long time by men who sacrificed in order to provide that care. And now they're taking that and spinning it and saying, no, they weren't taken care of. They were actually oppressed. They were kept from from jobs. They were kept from bank accounts. They were kept from credit cards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because they were women. They were held down and held back, and they blamed men for this. So what did they do? They said, "Well, since women were oppressed, we deserve so much more stuff." <laughs> And that's what they tried to do. And they've been successfully doing, you know, for the last 50 years is getting more stuff for women because they were, quote, oppressed. But guess what? The only reason they're being able to do that is because of gynocentrism. The same thing is happening now. They're using gynocentrism to get what they want. And, of course, men in legislatures jump to it. You know, they see a woman tied to the tracks. What do they do? They jump to it and they save her in some way or another because that's what gets them reelected. And too bad if the men don't get any, if their meets met, too bad. You know, we'll take care of the women and forget about the men. And that's basically what we've seen for the last 50 years. Let's take care of women and forget about the men. I hope you can see now how this gynocentrism 2.0 thing is really a potent mess for men. Men are now blamed as being the problem for having been stewards of things for many years. And on top of that, men still don't get a similar compassion and choice that women do. I mean, think about it. Completed suicides are 80% males. Nobody cares. Men are likely around 50% or more of the victims of domestic violence, and nobody cares. Over a million boys are circumcised every year in the United States. That's over a million boys who are genitally mutilated, and no one cares. Of course, there are strict laws forbidding any genital mutilation of girls. Hmm. Over and over again, we see the same thing. People simply don't care that much about the pain of men. I mean white mice. Yes, we are the white mice in some ways, and this brings down people's compassion for men and brings down people's interest in offering choice for men. You know, things like reproductive rights. Women have reproductive rights. They can choose to have an abortion, to have a baby, or a number of other options, but what about the men? What rights do men have? None. Her body, her choice. His child, her choice. I've worked with men who have come to me upset because their wife wanted an abortion, and he didn't. Men don't have a choice. Too bad. She's going to do what she wants to do. So men are lacking in both compassion and choice in gynocentrism 2.0. Plus, they're nailed as being the bad guys. Mm. This is a bad deal, guys, and we need to do something about it. Because really, the bottom line is, men are good. <laughs>